The importance of insurance is a fundamental issue about resilience in society. If you don't have certainty about being able to recover some of the money from disasters and from events, then actually you, you can't take risk. And we need society to take risk, we need businesses to take risk, we want people to make sure that they can rebuild their houses and their homes because that's what creates resilience in society. And so sharing that risk, which is the fundamental basis of insurance, is a vital component to stability in society. Well, the understanding of risk is, uh, is about the understanding of uncertainty to some, to some degree. Uh, what climate change does, of course, is it gives us uh, some variables that are really very much unknown. So one of the challenges that we have to face is when we have used 100, 200, or maybe even more years of meteorological data, for example, which have been fairly good representations of the risk we face in society today, that is no longer true. Climate change is making those 100 years of data much less valuable, if not in some cases completely useless. One of those challenges that comes with that, actually, is the fact that we don't completely know what's going to happen in the future either. And we're at that cusp and that pivotal position in our understanding of climate and the changing climate of we're not entirely sure what the future holds. We're also um, fairly sure that we, can, we can't rely on the past. And that puts us in a difficult position. But it's a position that we have to actually do something about. We can't sit here and just hope something's going to get better. And that's why the modelling of this is becoming really pivotal and really important. And it's also why we need to bring in scientists more than ever and make sure that the work they're doing about climate change becomes relevant for the man and woman in the street and for businesses who need to understand risk. We see globally that there's an increase of um, hazards, events, catastrophic events which are driven by climate. We see that um, simply because 70% uh, of the Earth's surface is water, we have increased um, evapotranspiration, so the, the hydrological cycle intensified. We see more heavy precipitation events, and this of course impacts on the societies um, where they are, but also on business and uh, on insurance. And um, one of the main motivations why we wanted to have this project is that we see insurance not only as um, a sector which is hit by climate change, but which is also an actor and, and is also um, maybe part of a solution when it comes, for example, to adaptation to climate change. The great thing about the H2020 project is that it brings together the insurance sector, the business sector, policy makers and scientists and, act and academics very directly into the same conversation, which is quite historically quite rare. So traditionally, I would say that um, in, in the insurance and finance sector, although it draws on science from the academic sector, it's usually through uh, an intermediate, <laughs> and their pathway, rather than having a direct connection between the scientists and the decision makers. So this, this bringing these parties much closer together increases knowledge on both sides, and it increases understanding on both sides, and it also speeds up how quickly you can get the latest science through into the risk modelling and the risk understanding and therefore into the real world decisions. So you just speed up that whole transfer by having them come together under the umbrella of, of the H2020 framework. So it's really, it's, it's phenomenally beneficial, I think. So the objective from initially from what H2020 were trying to do was to try and see if we could pull innovation from the science base into society. So that was our initial goal. And what we thought we were going to try and do is pick a number of different areas that we could try and prove uh, that we were able to do that. So uh, the setup of the project is uh, fairly straightforward. We have a series of demonstrators. They cover uh, some important interesting areas like flood, forestry, agriculture, uh, health and typhoon. And then around that we have two platforms that are a way of disseminating that information. So there's OASIS loss modeling framework, which is the model container, so that's the translation function for all the models that we're producing. And then there's OASIS hub, which is the data disseminator. So those are the two ways of getting that information into society. And then we have a steering group and we have a management team that sits around that to make sure it works properly. 
So one of the important things in the insurance sector is that there's a lot of information which is um, what they call proprietary, but then also there's an opaqueness, there's a lack of transparency. So we strongly believe that there should be open and transparent information flow to advance um, the field. So by sharing information, we basically create a level playing field where people can see data and see methods in an open and transparent field. And we believe this is essential for, for further innovation in the field. Because actually what, it, what the openness and freeness allows is it allows multiple actors to access the data. There is no barrier. So by making it free and open, everybody can have a look, everybody can see what we've done. They can then, if they're a business, they can then make their own decisions. But this way we can create a more competitive environment because many, many actors can see the inform same information. They can then build their own models as they wish. And of course they can create their own intellectual property based on it. But by promoting, uh, if you like, a baseline of open and free information, that creates innovation. This project is unique because it is end user driven from the start. The stakeholders were on board and um, this feedback we get from the insurance sector, for example, really streamlines our work and uh, also the standards we get, from, for example, from the loss modeling framework, really streamline our work, structure our work and um, link then in the end what we produce, all the knowledge we produce to something useful for others. And this is not only the, the insurance sector, it really goes beyond because we think what is in the end good enough for the insurance sector because they have really a demand on the quality of the output is of course then useful also for others. So we got involved in the innovation stream of the H2020 um, looking at how we can take um, our products from one technical readiness level to, to sort of more of a marketable readiness level. And we now have um, sort of seven products that basically are, are pretty much ready for, you know, for the market to use and, and some have already been used. So who will benefit most? I mean the deliverable is for the insurers first of all and the insurers who have not really put climate impact analytics into their uh, realistic disaster scenarios will have those now in the models they're getting. Um, and then I think ultimately the public sector, um, the insurer of last resort is the state, should benefit from a better know-how of, let's say, climate change impact. Oasis Loss Modeling Framework is essentially a translation tool between the science around natural catastrophes uh, to business users and society. And what that means is that we have to find a way of taking the intensity of storms, for example, or the height of floodwaters and the speed that they move, and the impact that that has on buildings or on crops or on forests, and translating that into a loss, uh, in a euro amount or whatever currency you want to produce, from which businesses and people can make decisions. But the reason why translation is necessary is that the format and the information that the scientific community has isn't usable in, a, in any shape or form really very easily by, by the man or woman in the street. So what we want to do is take that science, use a standardized process to get it into software from which you can ask questions about what is my 100 year loss going to look like, what type of events are going to happen and how can we show these on a map to try and understand about how the world we're facing today is going to change. So Oasis Loss Modeling Framework, first of all, it's a, it's a, piece of, it's a software platform. So that means it has a number of different components that perform some functions that are important to get this knowledge into something usable. And essentially the key elements are what we call a hazard module. So the hazard module is the part that takes account of windstorm or flood or earthquake or landslide, or, i.e. the hazards that we want to understand better. It has a vulnerability component. So that is the bit that takes the built environment or crops or forestry and the two things together are what produce some element of loss and that's essentially what the risk is. And to make that work you also need a couple of other things. So there's a big simulation engine in there. So that's the bit that statistically takes those two components of hazard and vulnerability and turns them into some information that can answer questions like, for example, what should I expect as a loss every 200 years or 100 years 
or every year. And those, of course, are components of the information that we need to make decisions in society. So for a scientist who wants to use a racist loss modeling framework, they have a model in a certain format. We have a platform that requires certain information. And we have a tool called MDK, Model Development Toolkit. And the tool will move the model from that format into our format. And that's how you get the model into Oasis. For users, if they want to use Oasis, there are a variety of ways you can do that. So first of all, everybody can download the software. Well, there are hundreds of models available that you can pick. Some are free, some are commercial. And you pick the one you want, you pay if you have to pay, and then you have to deploy that model in the environment that you wish. You then have to have one more piece of information, which is what we call exposure information. So this is usually the built environment. For an insurance company, this could be their buildings, or it could be a city, or it could be crops or forestry. You then have to pass that information into the model. The model then uses that to calculate the loss, and then it's available in the loss reporting engine, which then gives you that information in tables or in maps, whatever you prefer. The OASIS loss modeling framework is a very interesting development because it uh, is based on very clearly described standards. So um, all the different models that are implemented according to the loss modeling framework standard can directly interoperate. And, and this is something that makes it really easy to exchange different models, to exchange or plug models into existing workflows and exchange different parts and have a look at different uh, outcomes. So this is something that makes um, collaboration and exchange uh, in this context much easier. Standards in the end are quite important and what you see in, in academia and in many projects funded at the moment also at the European level, at the national level, is that uh, there are not many standards and we are modeling huge amounts of data and publish with it and often comparing different time slices, different data sets and so on. And the loss modeling framework provides these standards and also pushes us to follow these standards and the nice result in the end that we, is that we know in advance that we produce something that is useful for the end users because um, we follow these standards. It's, it's like the club, right? So it's in the middle of the whole project. It's a home, a community where you can address your model issues, uh, get advice um, and find a solution. So I, I would say it would be piecemeal. There would be pieces without OASIS. Mm -hmm. OASIS has set standards for the model. Um, it has set a technological basis for modeling with these models and made all of this available open source. And this is pretty revolutionary. The Danube project is actually a collaboration project between science and insurance industry and also beyond. And we are looking into the future climate risks in the Danube region and we try to support insurance industries and also municipalities to get a better understanding of what is the future risk when we think about climate change in the future, when we think about societal change, demographic change. We need to be prepared to take long-term decisions because the decisions that we take today uh, will last for the next 50 years in terms of technical production if you think about that. So therefore it is really important and crucial to have a well-informed decision basis and to take yeah, well-informed decisions today. What we do is really that uh, we produce large event sets of floods and in the end also droughts, heat waves and so on for the entire region which are of interest for end users from the insurance sector but also beyond we talk to city representatives also to farmers and other stakeholders beyond the insurance sector and um, see that there's a huge interest also because there was not much more, more knowledge in many parts in East and Central Europe and we really think that we can provide something useful there. And one of the results we see there is that already now we have an increase of risk related to climate change. There's really already a climate change signal in the impacts we have. 
And this challenges the protection level of buildings and also of critical infrastructure. And the likelihood that, that really big events happen is much higher possibly than it has been in the past. As an insurer, there, there are a couple of things about the project that are very unique and new. So one is that it covers the entire, so for example, from the Danube flood modeling perspective, it covers the entire Danube river network, which is a huge area. And that's something that is, insurers have not been able to access before. So there have been some models that have modeled partially the, the length of the river, but not the entire thing. And they're also able to tap into some of the really latest type of modeling, particularly of urban areas. Modeling urban flooding is a completely different type of problem to modeling rural flooding. And you have lots of complications such as drains and underground areas and streets and flood defenses in a way that you don't have so much in rural areas. And then the third element is bringing in the concept of climate change. So traditionally, I get most models that are available to insurers do not explicitly quantify the impact of climate change on the risk. So they will be using data that is historical. So the, the models are based on the average of history, which therefore, by definition, puts you somewhere in the past. Unless you can justify that, unless you can say that your climate is not changing. Now, if your climate is not changing, that is a that is the best way to build your model. But we know that that's not the case. We know climate change is changing. So there are these different versions of the model from a climate time horizon perspective. One which is a historical look at the risk. One it, which is looking at the current view of the risk, so where are we, what is the risk today, and what we would expect for the next few years. And one is a longer term future time horizon. And that's where we can get to, therefore, we can quantify the impact of climate change. Because you can keep everything else constant. You can keep the urban areas the same, you can keep your exposure the same, and you're basically looking at three different points through time past, current and future, and just looking at that impact on what the flooding risk is and what the impact is on expected losses. So I think there's really three very new things that insurers are able to access through this project. So the future Danube model um, says something about the flood frequencies and um, the, damage, the associated damages uh, with it in the entire Danube Basin and it can say something about flood uh, reoccurrences on a, on a 25 meter grid. And that is fairly detailed down to buildings, really. And so we can ask this model, how exposed is this particular building uh, or zip code or city um, to flooding? And what will a 100 year flood incur in costs uh, to this area? I mean, we have adapted it a little bit in terms of detail uh, or in terms of resolution and how detailed we represent rivers uh, to the insurance sector to, to meet the needs of the insurance sector. Because from a scientific point of view, we might not do it at such great detail uh, because we want to say something about larger areas. Um, but yeah, that worked really well and uh, we're kind of uh, proud of what we have achieved. <laughs> yeah. When we look into the vulnerability aspects, that means that we are looking into different um, types of objects like residential buildings or commercial buildings or agriculture or other sectors that are affected by, by floodwaters and we try to quantify to which degree these different entities or these different elements are actually damaged. So what is the, uh, the cost to reconstruct or to rebuild these members after they have been affected by flooding. And in this domain we are facing a lot of problems because we have a huge variability from building to building. We have large scatter and huge uncertainty which we need to consider. And therefore we are proposing in this um, project some new vulnerability models that look into different factors that are influencing this uh, flood loss. 
you might think of inundation depth as one driver of flood loss, you might think of inundation duration, but also about the building characteristics. So we need to take into consideration multiple variables to better describe these uh, damaging processes. And uh, in view of the uncertainty that we are facing, we also need to use probabilistic approaches. I think from a scientific perspective, we really moved forward our modeling approaches. So we are now able to consistently model flood losses in a probabilistic framework. This is something that is really new. But I think uh, very satisfactory is also to know that these models are actually applied for certain purposes. So we have given these models also to some partners from the insurance industry who are now willing to run these models for their real-world applications. And there's also interest from uh, public administration and municipalities to apply these models for their real-world problems. And I think this is something that is really satisfactory if you think about, okay, my or our research uh, now is really solving problems um, that are huge challenges. So that's something really cool. Yeah. This is another really interesting thing that we're seeing with OASIS, these types of OASIS projects, is that because OASIS itself, of course, is free to use, so the software that's traditionally been used by insurers is not free. It's actually very, very expensive. And, but OASIS is completely unique in that it's open source and it's free to use. So we are now seeing that type of software system being able to be used by governments, by cities, by non-commercial entities, because previously they couldn't afford it. So they are now being able to use the types of metrics that insurers use for their decisions. Our team is actually dealing uh, with the case study within the project. Uh, deals with the planning of the new wastewater treatment plant in Novi Sad. Novi Sad is the capital of autonomous province of Vojvodina and the second largest city in Serbia. Novi Sad uh, is unfortunately one of the only two cities along the Danube that doesn't treat it, its wastewaters. And that is why uh, it is very important to build the new wastewater treatment plant in Novi Sad. The estimated amount, amount of this investment is 70 million euros and it is very high for the economy of our city and our country. Therefore, the construction of the adequate plant with the possible and necessary adaptation measures in the case of flooding is very important because our community wouldn't be able to finance the damage caused by the flood events. We have tried to ensure climate change resilience of the large-scale infrastructure by testing how the models developed by our colleagues can be applied in the real world. This is important because there is always a question how the models developed in labs on small scales can represent the behavior of the large-scale objects. Also, we were wondering how we can help the communities, for example, how to identify the risk of climate changes, how to apply possible adaptation measures, how to communicate with local authorities and water management sector in the field of climate changes. So at first they were very, very skeptical because from their pure engineering point of view, uh, they couldn't fully anticipate the importance of uh, ensuring climate change resilience of this investment. Uh, the focus of their interest was to build an adequate plant in terms of optimal capacity and optimal technology, taking into account future wastewater generation, population growth in Novi Sad, and economic limits, of course. Uh, but after the preliminary uh, results of flood risk modeling, they have realized that they have to include this models and this climate change risk assessment and also possible 
and necessary adaptation measures in a feasibility study for the future wastewater treatment plant. Forest is so important and relevant because it is until now underinsured mostly and uh, nevertheless you saw the big events we had not in, only in Europe and the Mediterranean but now uh, this year also in Australia and in other areas. We even had in Scandinavia big forest fires not expected and uh, really something new and it is of course very much connected to climate change because um, higher temperatures and especially drier climate is the basis for additional forest fires worldwide possibly. If we look at the statistics, major forest fires are indeed rare. Forest fires themselves are very common. Hundreds occur every year, everywhere, but 99% of them are very small. The major fires are becoming more frequent with rising global temperatures and therefore of a concern not just to the forestry companies but also local communities, schools, installations, hospitals and the fauna and flora that are really impacted by wildfires such as we've seen in California or, or Australia. So when we talked with uh, uh, our partners uh, from uh, insurance uh, companies um, we understood that there was a gap to bridge between the existing tools um, the existing operational tools and on the other side um, scientific models that really relies on uh, meteorological factors because meteorology is very important for the propagation of a fire and so there was um, a gap to bridge and that's why we decided to build the risk fp2 so this means risk fire propagation and it's a tool uh, based on um, a huge weather database, so it includes a historical database for the past 30 years. So we can make simulation for any event during the past 30 years because we have the meteorological data. And uh, once the insurers have this information, they can select the specific days and make what we call the realistic disaster scenario. This means that they can uh, make some scenarios of propagation of fire. Now one of the biggest problems in ensuring forestry against fire or wind is knowing how bad can it be. And until you have these events, you, you have no idea. And they can run the fire and see how bad it can be without destroying a single hectare. And this is why I was so excited about it. Because if insurers can put a number or a value on the worst case based on early weather data for the last 20 years, then they can price more accurately. If we can't do that, then we guess. So that's why we need that knowledge. The objective was to uh, design RiskFP as a web-based tool for uh, support for decision making. So it has to be simple, easy to use and um, a friendly tool. So we decided to uh, design it with just a few functionalities. The first one is to plot the fire propagation, which is called the realistic disaster scenarios. Uh, those realistic disaster scenarios are uh, based on the risk map, which is um, the map uh, showing the easiness for a fire to propagate. And the two other functionalities are the um, seasonal forecast and uh, climate forecast to give the uh, frequency of uh, possible days with uh, extreme uh, event of fires. The next steps with Risk FP, now that we understand it and we can explain it to our colleagues and to our client companies, is to see if we can make more use of this across the insurance sector. New tools give credibility to the underwriting. When you're depending on some old timers that are just pricing forests based on their experience and averaging a few old figures, that is not the way insurance works anymore. Insurance is all about modeling losses and uh, deriving from those models, risk pricing at, at, at different levels of limits and, and tree types and, and so on. So forestry now has the tools with 
things like risk FP to, to bring discipline to the underwriting of forestry which wasn't available five, six years ago. In Sub-Saharan Africa you have quite often these community-based risk sharing mechanisms so that in case of a yield failure then your neighbor or your some relatives also help you when it comes to, to losses. But of course, when all are affected by losses, then nobody can help you. And if these losses get stronger with um, climate change, then this problem gets more severe. And so if you have a drought, for instance, it normally occurs not only in a single village, but it occurs in an entire country or even uh, transnationally. So and there it is quite important that uh, we come up with new instruments um, and this could be one of them, could be insurance solutions. So we have developed a model which produces a crop yield index which could be used for index-based insurances and with the index-based insurances you have the potential also to decrease the transaction costs because if you remember if you are in sub saharan Africa often the, the villages or the fields from the farmers are very remote and the roads are not in a so good condition and it's really expensive to bring climate justice to the fields. The point is also that um, when you talk about floods, when you talk about storms and it's quite clear if you have a loss on your house damaged by a storm or by a flood, it is quite clear this is, comes from the flood or the storm. But when we talk about crop yields, we have different aspects which in the end depend or which drive the crop yields. And it's the management, it's about the weather, and it's not so clear often if was it because of the weather or was it because of the management. And I think this makes also the crop insurance is a bit more unique or a bit more difficult in the end also to differentiate between what really comes from the weather and what comes from the management. And this is what we do with our models. So we take our models and are able to say, okay, this share of the variability is related to weather, while this share is related to management. So, and this makes the insurance in the end more affordable for the farmers because they don't have to pay for yeah, management errors, uh, what other farmers do, for instance, and it is also more transparent because then they know only the weather-related share of risk is covered and it will not force the wrong behavior. So it also avoids this so-called moral hazard. All these models are widely available in research and also beyond, but the combination of both having a statistical component and a process-based component and using both weather data and using remote sensing data is so far unique. So, and we make use of all these uh, data sources and make also use of the different methods, um, different types of models. And of course the models have some advantages and disadvantages and we try to bring the advantages um, or to, to combine the advantages of both models. We make sure that we just use these data which are publicly available just from the satellite, the Copernicus project from the EU. It's, uh, we use the data and we also use weather data which are publicly available. And on the other side also the model and all the modeling codes are published in peer-reviewed journals. And so everybody has, can get access to these publications and can also understand in a transparent way how the models work and the model could be used and is already in use. For instance, one reinsurance company in India is already using the model and we have also a pilot in Eastern Africa with the same reinsurance company which already used the model for their daily business. This is also the approach of the OASIS and so that we work with standardized um, chains with respect to using the same input data, using the standardized model approach and the big advantage of this is that we can also easily transfer this to other regions and other contexts and other crops. So if you say now we have developed this for Tanzania and I want to do this for instance in South Africa or in Brazil, this is easily doable. All the data are available, the models are there and we can just transfer this in, in an easy way. We also worked on 
the, the outreach or the dissemination of our result. And for instance, we have produced some episode on a um, t TV, which is called Shamba Shaba. We have traveled all over Kenya to find hardworking farmers. It's a quite nice format. Uh, this is broadcasted in Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. Get better yields and build profitable businesses. And it's reaching there more than 8 million smallholder farmers in particular. Also others are watching this. And so we made one episode on uh, climate change and insurances, which is uh, widely seen and it was a lot of attraction. And I think this is an incredible amount of farmers having, um, getting access to new information to what will happen in Eastern Africa with respect to climate change and how insurance solutions can help here. And this is what we did in the H2020 insurance project. I mean, it's for me, it's important also not only look at the business side, uh, which is maybe a bit more the focus of the Oasis, which is also fully fine because they are from the industry, uh, but also making us yeah, saying, okay, we have these positive effects with respect to food security, with respect to enabling farmers to invest in adaptation measures and I think this is a very crucial point and I think we should really say okay insurances have the potential also to enable this but insurances are no standalone product but they always should come together with um, enabling farmers to invest in adaptation and adaptation strategies. project we wanted to bring in sort of lesser explored areas and one of those is um, the link between climate and health conditions and how to manage you know chronic diseases with um, the impacts of climate change so Charité came forward and they wanted to look at um, how COPD which is a lung disease is affected by you know changes in climatic conditions across a year and link to that, how to manage that condition, understanding that on certain days there's going to be worse conditions in terms of climate and pollution for patients. We have a warming of the temperature and in particular in heat islands of big cities like Berlin and larger. And this heat island has temperatures in Berlin, for example, with much more than 40 degrees Celsius. So. And that is a question, if you are ill, you have problems to consult your doctor at that time. And you have to, a lot of problems to, to take care for you in the daily, in the daily uh, procedures. And if you look at the whole situation, we have a demographic change. We have much more old people in our society. And often it is combined with illness, with chronic illness like hypertension, like COPD, like asthma, like diabetes. Therefore, we have to take care for these huge patient groups and the first item of all is the vulnerability of this group. They are old, they are ill or both and therefore we have to take care for them and ensure them about their health. The result of our analysis are health damage functions, one for Berlin Centre and one for the city of Potsdam. Uh, and they link the number of daily hospital admissions uh, with temperature and air pollution. So we can uh, calculate future scenarios if temperature rises, if air pollution rises, what's happening with the hospitalizations. And uh, this we want to provide in, in a prototype for insurances so they can um, implement their numbers uh, instead of hospitalization numbers, uh, maybe figures for their costs and uh, then we add the climate scenarios and they can calculate how, how much the, the costs will be in the future with different scenarios. And uh, this now leads to um, for, for one maps. Oh, I can see maps of Berlin and, and Potsdam where um, the different risk ratios are plotted and uh, then also to a prototype for the insurers to enter uh, their own data. And we want to uh, have the feedback of the uh, insurers and uh, hear if they find this useful or um, <coughs> which developments they would like to see also. That's why it's called a prototype. <laughs> the results are accessible for everyone on the Oasis Hub. 
We hope that people come to learn that if they are looking for catastrophe modeling for information, then they can access the OASIS Hub and uh, don't have to contact uh, individual researchers, but it's all aggregated there and accessible easily for everyone. For example, uh, city governments uh, could profit. Uh, we could replicate this work in, in any other location. This is just an example to do this for Berlin and Potsdam. And we could show uh, which districts are uh, endangered, where the risks are high. So uh, city governments could prepare and uh, set, for example, heat actions plans in place uh, so um, they can adapt to what is coming. Um, I think the biggest challenge was that many people were unaware and therefore unprepared for the changes to come um, because uh, they didn't see uh, the link of climate change and effects on health of patients. So uh, we had to explain to them uh, which problems we are seeing which, which will be coming up and uh, many agreed and, and joined the project but uh, some stayed skeptical and uh, we hope that we can convince them with our results uh, that there is something they need to pay attention to and prepare for. If you look at insurance losses every year, you will find that hurricanes, which is the North Atlantic version of a tropical cyclone, are the dominant source of, of losses. And that's been true for the last 30 or 40 years. But now, um, increasingly, the, the value is in China. So you have areas like in South China around Hong Kong, which has maybe the GDP now of Florida. And they have maybe four typhoons every year. And that used to be a fishing village in Hong Kong, and now it's 50 million people, a huge amount of uh, trade, the world's biggest bridge, huge ports. All of that is new. So now we need to understand the risk of typhoons much more than we did before. There were three things we wanted to do in terms of the, the project. The very first thing was to build this catalog, so basically establish what has happened in the past. And one of the reasons we needed to do that is when you, when you look at what's happened in the past, it doesn't quite give you enough information for the risk assessment. So you, what you need to do is you need to take the data to build a statistical model which looks like what happened in the last 50 years, but also allows you to simulate thousands of cyclones. So you can examine also the probability of cyclones that maybe didn't happen at all. So that was the second step, to build a stochastic model. And the, uh, the real innovation was that the current way of doing these stochastic models is they generate uh, a typhoon somewhere over the ocean, just randomly generate it, then they randomly move it uh, across the ocean and then it makes landfall. And during that track, they also simulate the intensity changes and so forth. And we sidestepped all of this by simply focusing on the landfall. Because ultimately, that is what matters. It doesn't matter what happens a thousand kilometers five days earlier is irrelevant. So we're building a new type of model based on the new catalog. And then the last part, which we are just about to finish, is that there's some interest in doing what we call a seasonal forecast. So we all know a weather forecast, which is maybe five days. A seasonal forecast is not saying that any particular typhoon will happen, but it might tell you that for the entire year you can expect five tropical cyclones. This year, next year you might expect four, and it is trying to make what we call a seasonal forecast, so a total for the year. So if you are, for example, a city and then you need to be prepared for the emergency, you obviously want the five-day forecast. But maybe you, what you also need to do is you need to make sure that the infrastructure is in place. Most importantly, maybe you need to make sure that your budget is in place. So these are all things that you want to plan many, many months in advance. For insurers, they also have actually an insurance contract which needs to be done and delivered very early on. So you imagine you might need a contract signed in January or March, but certainly not in the typhoon season for your insurance product. So you need a good price for the premium and an agreed contract early on. So you really want access to the seasonal information maybe as early as January or even in December for a January contract. And therefore you might want to be interested in knowing whether this year will be particularly a high risk or a low risk. And this is the seasonal forecast can help those people make sort of informed decisions. How do we do this? So actually we found a new way of doing it. Um, and what we've discovered is that the, the normally people look at ocean temperatures. So this is one big predictor. So there is something called an El Nino phenomena, 
which is an oscillation of the Pacific uh, Ocean temperature, equatorial Pacific, a long way away from China, actually. But it determines, for example, where the cyclones are formed initially, and more importantly, it actually influences the wind circulation in the entire Pacific, so it affects what we call the steering wind. So the steering wind is basically some sort of a mid-level, five-kilometer height wind, which basically pushes the cyclone anywhere where the wind goes. And the cyclone is, is, is almost passive. It just it's, it gets carried along like a, like a vortex uh, in, a, you know, in your bathtub, and you just sort of push it along. So the, the, the seasonal forecast is really being able to predict this wind. And uh, the El Nino phenomena is an important phenomena. If you can predict that early, then from that you can infer what will happen about the landfall probability of landfall. So people have in investigated the, the importance of the phenomena for a long time, so it has been known for a long time. What's new from, from our point of view is that we've looked at not the sea surface temperature, which is what normally people look at, and because there are, of course there are satellite observations going back to the 1970s of sea surface temperature, but going back maybe only 15 years we actually have subsurface oceans, so you actually need to put buoys into the ocean and make measurements in the subsurface. And there we're getting a very strong signal in the subsurface. So we have looked back in the last uh, 20 years, 25 years, and we find that these subsurface temperatures do indeed predict what actually has happened in the last 25 years. So there's what we call a strong correlation. And we find that if that's unusually warm or unusually cold, then we get unusually high or unusually low uh, typhoon counts. And we can do this um, as early as January, if we look at the Pacific Ocean temperature, because it tells us roughly what will happen in the Pacific in the summer by looking at what happens, what is happening now in the subsurface ocean temperature. If you imagine that the sub-ocean temperature is like a memory of the ocean and eventually it is communicated to the surface and then the ocean surface communicates with the atmosphere and then that communicates with the typhoons. So there's a chain of uh, heat anomaly which can drive the circulation going back uh, many months before the actual event happens. So I think the glue within the project is what, what we call the Oasis Hub. So this is the website where we can put all the data. We have our catalog on there, we have our model, our stochastic model I described, and we have the seasonal forecast on that website so that it's free for the, for the users. Oasis Hub is a global platform for environmental risk and catastrophe information, uh, both in terms of data, tools and services. Um, it was formed out of a collaboration between the insurance sector and the uh, academic sector. Uh, the insurance sector wanting to bring data into one global hub and the academic sector wanting to very, very much more quickly innovate their sort of new data tools and climate services that they're developing you know all across Europe so the hub came about as a sort of need from both sectors but it's open to all sectors the information is useful for everybody. The problem of, of calculating risk is also a problem of information and the information which is there is often not available to everybody, especially not to um, the business, but also to the not to the public sector. And what the hub does is actively approach institutes and private sector to upload the data and provide them to colleagues and and people around the world in different areas, different sectors, and different regions. The OSS Hub is like an open community. It is open to everyone to uh, post their information on this um, platform. And they are also able to uh, see what is already around. They can have a look and find out what are possible uh, partners for collaboration because they have been working in the same region, they have done some previous work that is interesting to base on. So it's also like an exchange and communication platform, I would say, or a platform that might trigger exchange and communication. And I think uh, science should provide information um, to the scientific community for reuse and maybe reproducibility of uh, the research findings, but um, if someone wants to take uh, this information for commercial purposes, the Oasis Hub also offers the possibility to, to buy these data. And this is something that 
uh, is also a nice proof of concept that the work that we are doing is really relevant because if people go to the hub and say, okay, this data is very valuable for my work and I'm willing to buy these data, and this happened in uh, at least one case for our data sets for the Danube, so this is then also a nice uh, confirmation that the work that we are doing is relevant and it's also useful for practical applications. The insurers don't uh, have on board um, specialized risk modelers for every peril. They have, um, if they're very big, like Allianz or Generali, who were part of the project, then they will have a handful. Medium to small insurers don't have their own catastrophe experts. So basically, they have to access externally the know-how. Sometimes that's held by insurance associations, the federation of the insurance companies, but then I, we thought that this was a very good way forward. Um, science and then of course the technology that is coming from OASIS. So this is a sort of very good mixture we find. The OASIS project itself is in, I would say, although it's been going very successfully for several years now, it's still very much in its infancy in terms of the type of impact it can have. Um, its application to many types of decisions, not just insurance-based decisions, is, um, is very broad. And we're trying to encourage a community to grow up around using Oasis. For it to be like a, a true open source software system, where it's picked up by people around the world, and used and deployed and built off. And at times it can be commercialized in certain circumstances. You know, that's part of the licensing framework that's, that it enables. Um, so I think that in the next few years we'll see, and we're trying to find new ways of getting the, that to happen because the centralized system will not be able to get the scale that is really needed in order for all sorts of communities and governments around the world to understand their risk and to take decisions to, about how they're going to manage their risk and what the, how they're going to manage the impact of climate change on their countries and on their economies. Policy makers are often very driven by numbers <laughs> and economics, obviously, government policy makers. So through the risk modelling and the quantification that we do for insurance, we can put a number on climate change, a financial cost. And then that, I think, makes it a much more real to policy makers in terms of then they can quantify it. It's, it's not something nebulous. And then they can start to think about how they can take measures to adapt, to protect their population, to protect their assets. How much will that cost? Cost-benefit analysis, um, all these sort of economic principles can apply, be brought about it through this lens that we use in the insurance industry. We've learned a lot. We've learned how to work better between academia and business. Uh, we've learned how standards are so important. We've learned how it's really difficult sometimes to get access to data and that society uh, needs to think about making more data open. Uh, I think we've learned about how actually if we work together we can produce information and knowledge that can be shared amongst all and we can actually start making some decisions in business and society to deal with climate change. The next steps we see beyond the insurance project is that we have to scale our, our services to other regions and other continents and that there are possibly other hazards which we also have to consider. And um, with this ongoing climate change, I think the work simply will go on. What we have done now are demonstrators where we show um, there is additional value when talking to each other, but there are, there are so many things still to do that we, are, we, we, we deeply believe that um, there, has, there has to be further cooperation. Right now, I would say it's quite important to include the partners from the industry and from the governmental side from the first day on. I think this is quite important that you not develop something in science and say, hey, here's the product, would you like this? And then often it comes out, well, 
it is nice, but we cannot use this. So in the H2020 insurance project, we had a lot of insurance and reinsurance companies on board from the first day on and they, we in the end co-designed the products. And this was quite helpful for us that we say, okay, now we have a product which is scientifically proven, but it's also usable for the insurance and reinsurance companies. So out of the outcome of the project is the model itself, the quantification of the impacts of climate change, but also knowledge and knowledge sharing and, and connections between these sectors that traditionally wouldn't necessarily be talking to each other very well. So I think that dialogue is just as important as the risk modelling work itself and the knowledge of how to use these tools and to apply these tools for different types of decisions. So a, a risk model is not, you know, you, you need the human brain and you need to take, take decisions on the basis, basis of a model. Um, but a good solid model is uh, a very good support for decision making and that's what it's all about. So our work carries on. Um, we have with Oasis now a great ally. We have also with the scientists we've met through the project, allies, we keep talking. We're looking for the next projects and then getting better and better and better in predicting what is going to happen in the next 5, 10, 25, 50 years. I think that the Oasis H2020 project is, is really ad advanced in uh, looking at how society can use this scientific information for tools that can actually analyse the risk that society is having. So, so things like the tools, the flood tools, can be used to assess the potential for flood now and in the future. And with that, how to create or where to place new, new infrastructure. So protecting our economic future really, and also our life and our personal assets. So the project really does have a firm sort of grounding in um, looking after people really. <laughs>